Shall we continue our proceedings? Good afternoon. It's already uh, uh, five minutes past noon. Um, the witness is being summoned to come in at the moment. Thank you very much. Sorry being five minutes late. Welcome back, Mr. Jack. Uh, are you ready to proceed? Yes, Councillor, uh, I'm ready. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Jack, uh, you had given us a statement. Uh, do you recall that? Yes, I do. Uh, I'm not going to put in this statement as, uh, as evidence, because your testimony is very clear. Uh, but I just want to read out one paragraph in this statement, and I'll ask you to confirm whether or not that captures uh, essentially what you wanted to say about the uh, balances in the army. And uh, in this paragraph, you said as follows. Quote, within the army itself, there was some dash, to put it bluntly, dash, ethnic rivalries and ethnic imbalances. An overwhelming percentage of the foot soldiers came from one particular region or area, while the officer corps was perceived to be dominated by urbanites. So obviously, these imbalances did not all go well for the creation of a professional army, unquote. That's what you said in your statement, correct? Yeah, that's correct. <coughs> uh, the next paragraph in that statement went on to say, quote, the command structure was, I think, also very poor. When the Natak Nigerian soldiers came, the first thing that Colonel Dada did was to recommend the dismissal of Major Mabajob, who was the most senior Gambian officer at the time. Instead, Major Job was honorably retired and deployed to the Foreign Service as counselor at the Gambia High Commission in London. That, too, is what you testified to. Right. Uh, now, let's talk about the main principle in the arrangement between Nigeria uh, and, and the Gambia with regards to the military assist assistance. I recognize the fact that in your statement you did indicate that uh, you are not familiar uh, with the MOU that was signed between the two countries. Is that right? That's the position you still hold, correct? Um, <coughs> yeah. We have here uh, a copy uh, of, the, of the MOU, uh, and uh, I would uh, uh, send that to you to take a look at. Uh, are you aware, in fact, that there were two agreements between Gambia and Nigeria, and the first was called MAT, uh, that is Military uh, Assistance Team to Gambia, and the second is called NATAG. NATAG, Nigerian Training, uh, well, I don't know what the A stands for. I have to look for it in the, in, in the agreement. It's Nigerian Armed Force Training Assistance Group to the Gambia. Some people did say initially that it was advisory group, but it is assistance group as per the agreement. Uh, I would send that to you to, 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 to take a look at. I have highlighted some areas for you to, uh, to look at. Uh, Mr. Chair, just for the record, uh, we have previously had uh, a hearing or a meeting in camera wherein uh, documents from the Ministry of Defense were admitted into the record. Uh, and uh, this document is part of that set of exhibits, Exhibit 27, uh, dealing with the bunch of documents uh, pertaining to the arrangements with the Nigerians, uh, which had been sent to the Commission by the Ministry of Defense. Thank you, Council. I can confirm that in camera we were made aware of the existence of these documents. You may proceed. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jack. Uh, you would see that in the agreement uh, there is that portion that is highlighted. Could you mm -hmm. kindly read it out to the Commission, please? Okay. 
the, the group leader as the Gambia National Army Commander will be directly responsible to the government of the Gambia for the command, discipline, efficiency, and administration of the Gambia National Army. He will also be directly responsible for the discipline and control of the members of NATAC. E, members of NATAC will not take part in hostilities or other operations of a warlike nature undertaken by the armed forces of the Gambia, nor without the consent of the government of Nigeria, take part in the operations of the armed forces of the Gambia which are concerned with preservation of peace, internal security, or with the enforcement of law and order in the country, in the Gambia. Uh, thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Jack. Uh, you and I briefly went through the, uh, through the MOU, uh, and you would agree that we did not see any provision which deals or which gives operational command to Nigerians over the Gambian National Army. Do you, do you agree to that? Can you say that again, please? Uh, what I'm saying is uh, you and I have briefly gone through mm -hmm. the MOU together, yeah. and you would agree that the, we have not come across any provision which suggests that operational command of the Army was given to any Nigerian apart from the uh, Army commander. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, could you kindly tell us what the, arrange, what the de facto arrangement was uh, as of 1994 when Dada was still commander of the army in terms of command responsibilities with, within the entire structure of the military? <clears throat> Dada was the army commander of the GNA. And that's where it should have stopped. Did it stop there at all? No, I think uh, some of the Nigerian officers, you know, were as, uh, assumed um, command uh, positions at the company level, and uh, not at the platoon, but at the company <coughs> level, and the Farafenya barracks. Uh, do you think that was proper? No, according to the agreement, it w the c only person who should have assumed command position should have been the Army Commander, Brigadier Dada. Uh, but was this made an issue on the ground as things were operating? Was it really made into an issue or it was just uh, a matter that was left unsaid or unattended to? Well, the Gambian officers, as I said, do, they had complained about that. N not in writing, not officially, but, you know, in discussions, they would come and tell you that um, the Nigerian officers have assumed command positions which otherwise would have been the responsibility of the Gambian officers. And uh, I think I recall mentioning this to the, to, to the Vice President at one time. Uh, when the Nigerians arrived, of course there was also the British Army training team. Do you recall? Yes, the British Army training team, um, referred to as BAT. And uh, what was the result of the arrival of the Nigerians with regards to training in the Army? What was the? What was the effect of the arrival of the Nigerians on the training arrangements for the Gambia National Army, vis-à-vis, -vis, of course, BAT? But, yeah, BAT were doing a very good job, and um, they had um, gained the respect of the Gambian officers and men, and um, their competence was um, acknowledged by everyone, and then suddenly you have a huge group <clears throat> um, of Nigerian officers coming to the Gambia to carry out the same activities that they were 
um, assigned to. And this did not go down well with them, honestly. And um, they complained about the duplication and what was their role in terms of the training facilities which they were providing. Uh, in terms of, you mentioned the huge number of Nigerians that came. Um, well, we, we have received this document, of course, from the Ministry of External Affairs, and it's a letter dated uh, 25th February 1992. Uh, I will read out parts of that letter and give you a chance to comment on it, uh, if, if you wish. And uh, Mr. Chair, I will read out the letter because it's not marked with any uh, categorization in terms of confidentiality. So I think I can read it out. It does not say confidential. It does not say secret. So I can read it out. And the letter reads as follows. Urgent. The Ministry of External Affairs of the Republic of the Gambia presents its compliments to the High Commission of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to the Gambia and has the honor to inform that following the signature of the Memorandum of Understanding between the Government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and the Government of the Republic of the Gambia concerning the provision of officers and soldiers of the Nigerian, uh, of the Nigerian Armed Forces to assist in the command, training, and development of the armed forces of, of the Gambia. All arrangements have now been completed for the personnel of the Nigerian Army Armed Forces to come to the Gambia. In this regard, the Ministry of External Affairs would be grateful if the Nigerian High Commission would kindly and urgently inform the competent authorities that an advanced contingent of 40 40 officers and soldiers can be sent to the Gambia with immediate effect. This is, unquote, this is the request that we have made. 40 officers and men to come from Nigeria. Were you surprised, therefore, by the size of the troops that Nigeria sent? Well, this was at the request of the, uh, of the Army headquarters. So the Ministry of External Affairs was simply transmitting the request. And yes, I, uh, when I came over, when I took over as Permanent Secretary, I was uh, a bit concerned about the number. And I thought that it was, it was too much. It was above um, um Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, so the British had to leave because suddenly there's a huge influx of Nigerians who were to perform basically almost the same function uh, as the Nigerians, yeah. training. That's correct. That was the reason why they left. Because they thought that their role was no longer, I mean, their presence was no longer required when we have such a large number of Nigerians coming over to do the same job that they were doing. Okay. Uh, in your statement, you had highlighted some other problems. And I will read out this paragraph mm -hmm. uh, and uh, let ask you to confirm its accuracy or not. And it goes as follows. Quote, there were other problems with the presence of NATAC. The source of NATAC's funding and the administration and management of the resources provided by the Nigerian government were far from being transparent. Every so often, Colonel Dada would travel to Nigeria <coughs> and stay for long periods on the pretext of trying to mobilize additional resources for the GNA. Whether he succeeded in his quests was not discernible and there were no improvements in the infrastructure at the barracks, nor on the operational efficiencies of the GNA. What were clearly visible, however, were the flashy lifestyles 
of some of the senior NATAC officers in contrast to the problem of accommodation and transportation of Gambian soldiers. Unquote. Does that adequately reflect the position? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Uh, the na arrangement with NATAC started under the regime of President Babangida, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. And he was subsequently replaced, or General Sani Abacha subsequently became President of Nigeria, correct? Yes. And uh, do you know what happened with regards to Dada, who was in Gambia, as at the time Abacha assumed, assumed office? Um, <coughs> his, um, his contract expired. And uh, the Nigerian um, Dada, General Abacha decided to send another army officer from Nigeria to replace Dada. How did Dada take that uh, replacement? He did not like it at all. I mean, he appealed to the, to the government, to the former president, to intercede with Abacha so that he'll get an extension. I remember accompanying uh, Vice President Sabali to Abuja as a special envoy of President um, Jawara to Ab Abacha um, for an extension of Dada's contract, but it was not, um, Abacha was not agreeable to it. He insisted on, on um, Guadabe coming over to assume command. Do you know whether there was any reason why Guadebe was sent out of Nigeria to Gambia to assume this position? I think um, Sani Abacha wanted him out of Nigeria because he was a known coup maker, you know. Who was the known coup maker? Uh, Guadabe. I think he had involved himself in all the coup d'etats that had taken place in Nigeria while she was there, while she was an army officer. Um, so because he was a known coupist, yeah, General Abacha wanted him out of Nigeria, and Gambia was well, <laughs> a good place to send him to. I mean, yeah, he felt um, for his own um, um, security, he thought that it would be better if um, if, Abbas, if, if Guadabe was not around. Did, as at the time Guadabe was being proposed for Gambia, did Gambia know that this man was a serial coupist in Nigeria? <coughs> no, I don't think so. Maybe it emerged afterwards. Emerged afterwards. Yeah. Not. So did did. Uh, just hold a second. Um, uh, let me just go through my documents. Uh, the appointment of Guadebe, did you have anything to do with it? Yeah, I conveyed the letter to him. Oh, I conveyed the decision of the president to appoint him as uh, as the commander of the Gambia National Army. I was uh, the permanent secretary, so it was my my responsibility to write a formal letter to General Guadabe or Colonel Guadabe at the time. Could could you kindly read out the essential parts of that letter? Uh, the date to whom it is addressed, uh, the paragraph de dealing with the appointment, and then the paragraphs that state the responsibilities of the person being appointed. Um, the letter is dated um, 3rd of June, 1994, and it's addressed to Colonel Lawan Guadabe, Army Headquarters, Marina Parade. It says, Dear Sir, I am directed to inform you that His Excellency the President of the Republic and Commander-in-Chief of the 
Armed Forces is pleased to appoint you on contract as Commander of the Gambia National Army in accordance with Section 11, 2, brackets, 3, brackets of the Gambia Armed Forces Act, 1985. The appointment is for a period of two years with effect from 6th June, 1994. As Commander of the Gambia National Army, you shall subject to the general di direction of the Commander-in-Chief and such regulations as may be prescribed be charged with the control of the Army and the responsibility for administration of the armed forces as a whole. Um, subject to the general direction and uh, control of, of the Commander-in-Chief, the responsibilities for the operational use of the Army shall be vested in you. The Commander-in-Chief may give you such directions with respect to the operational use of the Army in the Gambia for the purpose of maintaining and securing the public safety and public order. And you will, you will comply with those directives, with those directions, or cause them to be complied with. As Commander of the Gambia National Army, you are expected to familiarize yourself with the provisions of the Gambia Armed Forces Act 1985. In addition to your functions of control and administration of the Gambia National Army, you will be required during your term of office, A, to continue the ongoing reorganization of the Army to improve discipline and efficiency, B, to strengthen and vitalize the officer corps to enable them to exercise effective command over their men and to supervise them properly, and C, to train the Gambia National Army. Then the rest is about the salary scale and uh, allowances. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Jack. Can you, bring, can you give him the two documents back, please? So essentially, this sets out what <coughs> Mr. Guadebe was supposed to do. Yes. Um, do you know or whether uh, Mr. Dada, in fact, left the Gambia after his, after his contract ended? No, no, he was, he was still here. He was still here. I'm, I mean, this letter of, um, to, to Dada, to Guadabe, <clears throat> was dated um, June, I think, June 3rd or, or June 6th. Can you remind me, please? 3rd June 1994. 3rd June 1994. He was already in the, he came to the country on his first visit, you know, and I insisted that he hasn't got a letter of appointment from the by the president. Dada was still around, so afterwards we got confirmation from the office of the president that the president has agreed to his appointment. That was when I uh, we wrote this letter and uh, gave it to him because he was at army headquarters at the time. But Dada was no longer the army commander. He wasn't going to the um, to army headquarters, but was still in town and at his residence. Guadabe stayed for a few days, I think, a couple of days, and then went back to Nigeria. By the time he came back, the coup had taken place. So as at the time the coup was taking place, there was no de jure in country, there was the army commander was not present at all. No, <clears throat> because Dada was no longer the army commander. Um, Guadabe, who was the army commander, was not <clears throat> excuse me, was not in town, was not on post. So effectively, the the army was um, leaderless. And uh, who was acting? in the absence of the army commander? 
I think it was a, a Nigerian officer, Colonel Akoji, Akoji or Okoji? Colonel Akoji, I think he was. There. He was always in charge whenever Dada left. Was this an acceptable situation? No. In your statement, you called it very messy. Yes, because um, he had no power to command, authority to command the Gambian army, Colonel Akoji. In the absence of, um, of Dada, there was, no, there was no deputy commander. And, uh, the, the problem was that he was never in town, hardly in town. So it created a vacuum in the command structure. Uh, we have hard testimony suggesting that Guadebe would go to the camp when he was here, organize a meeting, and then Dada would also go to the camp and organize a meeting. Uh, I'm not you ever, have you ever heard of no, that? No, no, I'm hearing that for the first time. Uh, thank you, thank you very much about that. But if, if that ever happened, how would you describe the situation? You, the first instance, the vacuum, you called it messy. What would you call this one? If both commanders were to go to the army, head, army camp, say in Yindum barracks, and, and, and call meetings of their own, uh, each portraying responsibility for the army, how would you describe that? Oh. Oh, 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 oh. That, that, that would be a terrible situation because Dada, once he was relieved of his position, he had no right to go to the to the army command to the to, to, to the barracks, and he should not have been he would not have been allowed in, much less to address the much more to address the troops. Uh, at this stage. The gendarmerie had already been transformed, and parts of the gendarmerie marched with the police. Do you recall that? Um, yes. And what is your take on that? Well, I think it was a big mistake to amalgamate the, the two forces, the gendarmerie and the, and the police, because the, I mean, the gendarmerie was uh, paramilitary. I mean, they, they had some training in uh, could handle weapons and heavy weapons, for that matter. Whereas the police is just for maintenance of law and order. The, 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 the gendarmerie was a, a support outfit to the army in the event of any, you know, Uprise any for the protection of the borders of the country and uh, and, and uh, any any threat from outside the any threat coming from outside the country. So once it was moved to the it was uh, amalgamated with the with the with the with the police. The country lost uh, a sort of a fallback. Um, uh, military or paramilitary unit that could um, prevent, that could have prevented or at least made it difficult for the uh, army to take over power easily. In your statement, you wrote as follows, and uh, uh, let me read that out and find out if that captures adequately what you intend to say. By the way, Mr. Chair, the witness wrote his own statement. Uh, so uh, that should make it easier for him to confirm what he wrote or did not write. And the paragraph states as follows. The political decision, quote, excuse me, the political decision that was taken to march the gendarmerie with the police force was another policy, policy decision that complicated matters in the security sector. The gendarmerie was created at the time of the Senegambia Confederation and attracted well-educated, bright, and intelligent young men. It was seen as a counterforce. 
it was, excuse me, it was seen as a counterforce and a counterforce to the army. And one stopped a possible mutiny by some soldiers of the, of the GNA on their return from peacekeeping duties in Liberia. After the amalgamation of the gendarmerie with the Gambia police force, all the heavy weapons at the gendarmerie were transferred to the army as the police were not supposed to handle such type of weapons. It was a decision by the political leadership. And as permanent secretary, I was not involved in the process. Consequently, there was a concentration of firepower in one section of the security forces, and this must have facilitated the coup itself, unquote. That's the position you maintain, correct? Yes, yes, I do. What do you say to the suggestion by some witnesses that the gendarmerie could not have been or was not designed to be a counterforce to the army? What do you say to that suggestion? Well, they once stopped, um, you know, soldiers marching on to Banjul, those guys coming back from peacekeeping operations. And, uh, yeah, in, um, I think they, they, you know, they could not counter force, but, you know, they could have prevented, made, made it difficult, f you know, for the, for, the, for the army to take over. But in your own mind, as Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Defense, uh, you always saw the gendarmerie as somewhat of a counterforce to the army, isn't it? Yeah. So as the main person responsible for policy in the, in the, in the Ministry of Defense, uh, you would think, therefore, uh, that the suggestion that the Zandarmuri was not a counterforce would be erroneous, wouldn't it? Well, I still maintain that the Zandarmuri, you know, could have been um, uh, an obstacle to an easy takeover of the country. Could have been or was, which is the position? No, because it, by the time the coup took place, it had already been amalgamated. That's why I said... It could have or you been. mean in 1994, it yeah. could have been. Yeah. But prior to the amalgamation, it was indeed a counterforce. Is that yeah, your yeah. suggestion? Yeah, and it, you know, it once stopped uh, a meeting as, you know, well, not an unruly group of soldiers trying to march to Banjul. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, now let's talk about the intelligence outfit at the time before the coup? What was the situation? Well, the, we had the National uh, Security Service, NSS, I think which had, um, was a bit deficient in terms of um, their capacity to do proper analysis of the security threat. Who was the head at the time? Uh, it was Keba Sisi when I was permanent secretary. The late Keba Sisi. Yes. Um, and uh, your testimony is that the NSS, as it then was, had this, uh, um, this intellectual gap, uh, that is the people with the necessary skill set to do proper intelligence analysis. That is, that is your evidence. Uh, Maybe, maybe I, I, you know, I got it uh, a bit uh, wrong there. I mean, I was referring to the head. There head was, himself. There, yeah, there were some, 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 some very uh, good officers. In the but Kebasi was not up to par. That's in my view, suggestion. Yeah, in my view, he was not uh, up to par. He was, yeah. uh, he was a detective, you know, and uh, being head of, you, you don't, you, you don't need to be. Um, a police officer to head um, an intelligence unit. You know, it could be most most intelligence units are not headed by police officers, but people with expertise in um, in security matters. Yeah. Uh, 
but uh, what make, made you to arrive at this conclusion that uh, really the head was not up to par when it came to analyzing um, intelligence information? Because there was this um, joint intelligence committee and at every meeting it would kick off by um, um, the director general of NSS making a presentation on the security situation in the country. And uh, it is always about Kukwai Samasanyang, mobilizing people and trying to, you know, to invade the Gambia from either from Casamas or from the, from, from the, um, from the coast. And uh, he would never focus on any internal threat within the army or the or the or the, or the gendarmerie or, or anywhere. I mean his he or, or he, his analysis was always on on the um, Kukai Samasanya and not the GNA. We have received testimony that in nineteen ninety four or thereabouts there were lots of rumors of Ku 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 wolf, 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 as some said, and many of them panned out not to be true. Were those rumors of coup, uh, did they in fact find themselves in the briefings that you received in the Joint Intelligence Committee? No. None of these rumors ever mm, were no. ever reported to the Joint no, not, Intelligence not, not, Committee? Not, not that I can recall. How about the plan to overthrow Jawara when he arrived at the airport on 21 July uh, 1994? Was that ever reported to the Joint Intelligence Committee? No. So all the reports you received focused on external threats, in particular Kukai Sambasanya? Yeah, yes. In hindsight, would you say that there was a massive intelligence failure? Yeah, I would say that. How about military intelligence? Military intelligence, I think they have a very small outfit, uh, uh, one or two officers. And um, the National Security Council, which was chaired by the president, never held a single meeting. Uh, I would draw your attention to a paragraph you penned in your statement, and it says as follows, quote, the army have its own military intelligence outfit, but it was skeletal at that time. The Armed Forces Council that the Permanent Secretary of Defense was supposed to be sec Secretary of was not in existence by the time I became Permanent Secretary. I, I, and I cannot fathom the reason, nor was I briefed about its role and functions. Of course, we had the Joint Intelligence Committee in brackets, JIC, which was chaired by the Secretary General and whose membership comprised of the NSS, GNA, IGP, Director of Immigration, and the Permanent Secretaries, Secretaries of Ministries of External Affairs, Interior, and Defense, the Security Advisor uh, to the President, among others. The JIC would normally meet once a month and receive security updates from the NSS Director General. His focus was always on the activities of Kukwai Sambasanyang, plans to destabilize the country from afar, and hardly on any on internal threats to, the, to national security. That reflects that. That yeah. covers what you said. Yes. And the next paragraph I would also like to read says, the oversight of the military left much to be desired. It was not as robust as it should have been. 
Can you expantiate on that? Yeah, because the oversight of the military could, um, like I said earlier this morning, the most effective way to oversee the for civilians oversight of the military of the military is through a committee of the of the people's representative and this was not in existence and um, at the level of the ministry really we did not have the the expertise you know to oversee the the, the ministry the the army that, that is <coughs> that is quite an honest assessment seeing that you are permanent secretary and you are willing to acknowledge that uh, as at the time uh, the, you did not have the expertise for that um, in spite of the fact that of course as civil servant uh, you, you are on top uh, in terms of uh, public administration. Uh, I just want to read out further what you have in that paragraph. And you went on to say, and I quote, it is difficult for me to answer the questions of what mechanisms, if any, were put in place in order to counter a coup because I was at the Ministry of Defense just for two years. But the most important thing I wish to highlight here is when you said there was no defense policy as such, unquote. That was the situation, wasn't it? No defense policy at all. Mm, maybe there was a concept of what to do in the event of an external, you know, I, I mean, invasion. Uh, which was, if you can recall? Which was to uh, protect key installations and uh, hold out until such time that uh, the international community can come in to provide support. But how about for internal threats? Was there any policy at all? Um, Para, as far as you know? No, I think the, I mean, the only way internally would have been to gather as much evidence as possible. Um, intelligence as possible, you know, to know what was happening within the, within the armed forces, within the security sector, so that the political leadership can be appraised of the situation. But as I said, this was a deficiency. So the dependence was really on intelligence, but the intelligence failure was massive at the time in view of the fact that it focused solely on Kukoi and not on the internal threat? Um, yeah, I'll go along with that assessment. Did it ever occur to anybody to raise the alarm that there are rumors of coup, coup, coup always, but you have not received any intelligence report on that particular issue? Was it ever raised as far as you can recall? Um, um, Council, there are some things to bear in mind. The, the president, the army commander, had direct uh, access to the president. The director general of NSS also had direct access to the president. And uh, so there, were, there, there could have been uh, consultations between those officials and the president, which did not filter down for the simple reason that the National Security Council was not operational. Kindly tell us about 21 July, 1994. Hmm. I think uh, in the morning of the of 29 July, 21st July, 21st. But sorry, the Vice President and Minister of Defence 
had to go to Farafenya. He said he had uh, his, his brother passed away, so he would not be at the airport. And uh, she had delegated the Attorney General and Minister of Justice to go and receive the president because he was he was next in line in the order of precedence. So the vice president, the Minister of Justice, went to the airport to to receive the president, and uh, at the information I got afterwards was that at the airport, the Gambian armed forces were, some of them were armed, and um, some of them carried weapons, and the Nigerians disarmed them in public. At what stage did you receive this information? No, this was well after the coup. You mean well after the coup? No, after the coup. It may be, you know, what, the following day, on the day of the coup or afterwards, you know. But not, you know, not on the day itself. Because I was not at the airport. Uh, why were you, not you at the airport? As I said earlier, civil servants don't go to receive the president at the airport. Unless you are the Secretary General of, or, or the Permanent Secretary Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, good. So, do you know whether the president was ever briefed about what happened at the airport on 21st July, 1994? I, I would doubt it because, you know, what I uh, was told was that uh, when he arrived and uh, he was received by the, by the Minister of Justice and other members of the cabinet entered his vehicle and drove straight to Banjul and the Minister of Justice, you know, branched off at Westfield or some other place and went home. Because normally the Vice President would go with the President uh, up to State House and debrief him if there's any important issues that would um, need his attention or his, um, that should be brought to his knowledge. But that, that, I don't think that happened on the 21st. And the Secretary General was not in town. And uh, how about the 22nd? Can you tell us what happened that day from the moment you went to work onwards? Um, I went to work as usual early, and uh, there was an American um, naval vessel visiting to take part in um, an exercise with the uh, Marine Unit and the GNA. Normally, it's the, yeah, it's the practice that the captain of the vessel would call on the permanent secretary at the Ministry of Defense. So on the morning of the 22nd, Whilst waiting for the Americans to come in to my office, I received information that there were some problems at the, at the Indum barracks, that the soldiers had broken into the armory and um, taken out weapons. And, uh, who, uh, gave you, who gave you that information? I got it first from... Um, the Under Secretary Abdul Kohl, Abdul Kohl, and then later the Army Command, the Nigerian, most senior Nigerian officer at the time, the Colonel Akoji, also called. And told do me do about you it. recall at what time of the day you received this information? Well, this must have been around 8.30 or so, very early in the morning. At this stage, did you learn that it was a coup in the making? Um, no, I was told that they had uh, broken into the armory and armed themselves. But then you become, the moment you hear that, you know, you, you begin to wonder what was going to happen next. And what did you do with that information? Oh, I informed the vice president as soon as he arrived in the office. And how... Tell us what you told him and how he reacted to that. I told him that 
sir. I've just received very disturbing information from Yindom that the army, some officers had broken into the armory and armed themselves with heavy weapons. And uh, this is not something that um, would, um, that, that was very concerning. And uh, they could be moving over to Banjul. And that's what exactly Did what he say anything? Yeah, he was, he, was, he was ruffled. He was confused, you know. It was just as the Americans were about to enter my office. So I told him, in fact, the Americans are here to pay a court to call. But I think I should bring them in for you to receive them. What did he say? Yeah, I said, yes, yes, bring them in, bring them in. Did he say anything about the information you gave him earlier that members of the armed forces in Yundum have broken into the armory and armed themselves with heavy weapons and could possibly be heading towards Banjo? What did he say to that? Well, he didn't say, he didn't say much. He was, uh, he was, he was in a state of confusion and uh, it was about that time that the, that the Americans entered my office, oh, his office. He welcomed them and uh, told them that they have, there's a problem at Yindum Barracks. And what else happened there? Oh, and he excused himself. The Americans started as what is happening. The ambassador then, Ambassador Andrew Winter, asked, what is happening? So he said, yeah, we have just received information. We are trying to gather as much information as possible as to what is happening. But what the initial information we received is that they have broken into the armory and they have armed themselves and could possibly be heading to Banjul. So he excused himself and said that he was going to see the president. So Do you recall what time this thing occurred? Was about Approximately? It was, must have been between 9 and 9, because the Americans were supposed to come and see me at 9 o'clock. And they were punctual. So let me say nine, between 9 and 9.20. Do you know whether he went to see the president yes. at all? Yeah, he went to see the president and came back and uh, informed the Americans that the he yeah, had just briefed the president about what is happening in, uh, at, at the Union Barracks and discussed with the president. And the president um, asked him to make two requests to the Americans. So the ambassador said, yes. What's the request? Said, want, the president wants his family wants to be evacuated to the vessel and his family. But that was not true. That was not true. Could you say that again? That was not the, that was not correct. The president never requested to be evacuated. The but vice president lied? Well, he was not telling the truth. So he lied? Yes. And what else did he say to the Americans? The second request was for the Americans to provide support, uh, assistance, and stop the, you know, the meeting. Uh, How did the Americans react to that? Oh, after a brief consultation between the captain and the ambassador, they said there's no problem. We can take it in the family at, um, and the, the, the president and his family, you know, to the boat. But as far as uh, intervention was concerned, he had no power to authorize, you know, the American troops. Did the ambassador say that in the office yeah. of the vice president? Yes. So essentially, let's try to get this clear. The vice president made two requests. 
One was to evacuate the president's family. The president never made that request. Yeah, that's what the president told me afterwards. Afterwards. The second is that he made a request for American military intervention, which was declined there and then. Correct? Well, the ambassador said he had to contact Washington. He cannot authorize or, oh, you know, that, you know, the Americans here couldn't take that decision. That had to be a direction from, from, uh, from, from Washington. You said that President Jawara told you that he never made the request for evacuation of himself and the family. Yeah. Uh, when did he say that to you? Yeah, it was in London some years afterwards. How did you feel when you heard that? I was, uh, I was shocked, you know, because I thought that somebody was conveying um, a request from the president. But the president told me that he never requested to be evacuated. You were shocked that the vice president would lie about that? Is that your testimony? Mm, yeah. So after the Americans accepted evacuation of the president and his family and uh, informed that they could not unilaterally or they could not in Gambia make a decision to intervene, what happened thereafter? Well, you, you know, they took the president to the vessel and uh, the state house was virtually empty. Everybody left. But how did it happen that the president was taken to the vessel? He had not made that request. How did it happen that he was taken to the vessel? I, I, I don't know. I was, I, I was in my office. What transpired in the at the residence was, uh, I was not prepared to it, but I knew that he was, I could see, you know, they were getting into the, into the American Ambassador's car and other vehicles, you know. So. so you remained behind? I stayed in the office for some time. And what happened after that? Afterwards, I was advised to leave the office. By who? By um, one of the state guards. Do you recall who? I think it was uh, Musa Jame. What was he at State House at the time? He was, uh, he was one of the state guards. You know. So, at uh, this time, were the coupists already at State House or not? No, no, no. They were, they were coming. They were not in Banjul even. They had not entered Banjul. So, what time did you leave State House? Ah, as soon as you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes after the president left. That would be around what time, as far as you can recall? Um, maybe around quarter, half, between half nine and quarter to ten. Where did you go when you left the state house? Um, I went to a friend. I went, I went home. You know, I didn't go home. I, I, I stayed, I went to my, to the family compound in Banyu. For how long did you remain there? Maybe about 20, 30 minutes trying to communicate with my family in, um, in, in, in Fajara to advise them, tell them what was going on. And that they should, uh, yeah, eventually got, um, to my wife, my late wife, and told her what was happening, and that they should um, just be indoors. Did you remain in your family home in Banjul for the rest of the day? No, 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 I went to the vessel. I wanted to know what was going on, you know, because, you know, there was, until that time, there, up to that time, there was still a government in place, and there was a government of Sadao Rajaura.
from your family home in Banjul, where did you go first? Um, yeah, I went to the police station. I, I, I can't recall. That was the first place you went to, yeah. the police station. Yeah. Do you recall who you saw at the police station? I saw the then Inspector General of Police, Pasala Jain. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a flurry of activities. People were coming and going. The police come out, uh, advisor also, a British officer, was also at the police station, was at the office of the uh, Inspector General of Police. He was trying to coordinate the resistance that was uh, being led by um, Major Chongan, or Colonel Chongan. You know, so there were a lot of officers coming in and out. You know. Did you hold any meetings at all as to your action to be taken? The, at, the, at the police station? Yes. No, because, I mean, there was already action being taken by the, um, by the TSG, the Territorial Support Group, under the command of uh, Captain Ch uh, Major Chongal. At this stage, did you see um, an officer, TSG officer, called Captain Soare at the time? Yeah, he was at the he was at the police at the police station at one time. You saw him at the yeah, police station. Yeah. Uh, did did he say anything to you or the IGP at the time? Mm, no, not to me. But I could recall him telling the IGP that you know, I mean, the situation is getting hopeless, and the the, the troops are advancing to Banjul. Did he, in your presence, say to the IGP that he had abandoned post at the bridge and that the soldiers have already crossed? I, I can't remember. I don't think so. Not in my presence. How about uh, a young officer at the time called Lieutenant Bineminte? Do you recall seeing him coming to the IGP's office? I didn't know them very much, so uh, you know I can't. So you can't tell. Where so they... I knew, but you know. I mean, For how long did you remain at the IGP's office? About, I mean, maybe thirty minutes or so. And what happened after that? Afterwards, I decided to go to the vessel to. Find did, out what was going on. Did you go alone? To the vessel? Yes. Yeah. And what happened when you got there? I got there, I found the president and his family, former vice president Sabali, uh, former finance minister Bakari Dabo, and uh, the bodyguard, the pro, um, uh, the ADC was there, I think, um, Gasama, and uh, Kababayo, who was the head of the of the, of the presidential um, of the state guards. And who else, if you can recall? Um, and of course, the ambassador was there, and. Yeah. Uh, oh, I got it. Yes. Well, uh, did you have occasion to discuss with Jara and the entourage there? The only thing we discussed was when um, I think it was um, Kababaja who said the, the, the troops have crossed the bridge and uh, they are advancing towards Banjul, but we understand that they want to, they are ready to, you know, negotiate 
they have some demands, not negotiate, they have some demands they want to put before the political leadership. And what happened after that? Uh, at, uh, the president said, well, yes, we can, we can listen to them if they have some demands to make. You know, we can, you know, things, you know, we should, someone should go and meet them and, uh, and talk to them and work out the, the details or the logistics of such a meeting. And what happened after that? Well, I was expecting that at least the none of the political persons there would, uh, none of the politicians would want to go, volunteer to go. So uh, I, um, Keba Sise was there, sorry, he was also at the, ves at the vessel, and the security advisor. Who, who was the security advisor? It was a Nigerian, can't recall his name. You can't recall his name? No. Okay. And uh, who else was there? And that's about all. How about Pasala Jain? Did you see him that day? Yeah, I was in his office before I went to the vessel. Did you see him afterwards? Yes, I saw him afterwards because when we, when it was agreed that I should go and meet the troops as the permanent secretary, together with the uh, director general, NSS, Kiabasise and the security officer, then someone suggested that we should pass by and um, involve the, the inspector general of police. So we went back to the police headquarters and told the IGP about the mission that uh, was entrusted to us by the president and that he should join us and he agreed so we went we left police headquarters how many of you left I think I was with five of us myself um, the security advisor and press and pass out of jail. Four. Four, yeah. And, uh, and uh, how did you guys go there? What was your means of transportation? I was in my vehicle, which had a civilian, you know, just an ordinary number plate, not the GG. Um, I think pass out of jail was uh, in his own vehicle. So I traveled with the, with Keba Sisi and, uh, and, uh, and the security advisor. So you traveled in a convoy of two vehicles. Your vehicle, uh, you were there, Keba Sise and the Nigerian security advisor, and the IGP, Pasala Jang, followed in another vehicle. Yeah. So. Uh, which vehicle was in front? I was in front. Okay. And uh, you left the police headquarters together, and what happened after that? Well, we got to the... Before we got to the Royal to the hospital, when we saw them really, the troops advancing, I told the driver <coughs> to stop. And uh, we got out because that was the only vehicle on the road at the time, and it was attracting unnecessary attention. So we, you know, we descended from the vehicle and. Uh, started walking towards the, the troops, the advancing troops. How many of you? Myself and uh, Pasalaja, no, not Pasalaja, in the Kavasisi and the security advisor. How about Pasalaja? I, I did not see him. Once we, he was with us, I guess at one point he just simply disappeared. So as at the time you parked your vehicle around along Independence Drive, walking towards uh, these guys who are the military, the soldiers walking towards coming in, 
that point you did not see Pastor Alajai? No. Did you see him again? Up to today, no. Do you know where he went? I have no idea. Do you ever, have you ever received an explanation as to what happened? No. Nobody ever mentioned how he left that scene or how he left that convoy? No, nobody has ever explained. So you have no explanation as to what happened to him? Yeah. Okay. So the three of you, you march towards the oncoming soldiers, correct? Yes. And can you tell us what happened? Um, when we got to the um, to the um, Banjo City Council, that's where we are stopped. Singate was leading the advancing troops. He said, "You stop." So we stopped. And um, first thing he did was to tell the Nigerian advisor to go away because. This was no business of his, and um, he asked one of his soldiers to put us under arrest, Kebasi and I. So we were marched along, started going with the advancing troops. Did you have the chance to explain to them what your mission was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were not interested. Can you tell us that conversation, who you spoke to and what you said and how it unfolded? I told Singate that we are here because the president wants, we understand that you guys have some demands you want to make to the authorities and the president has asked us to come and meet you, see how this thing can be worked out. Who was the spokesperson of your group? I was the one who was speaking. So, so tell us exactly what you told him and how he responded. I told him that we got information that you know, the soldiers have some demands to make before the political leadership, and uh, we were instructed by the president to come and meet you and work out the modalities of such consultation. And he was not interested. He said, we are not interested. That's all he said? Yeah. And what happened to you guys? No, we were marched all the way to up to the um, National Library, now the, the, the museum, and uh, then afterwards put in a, in a van. We drove all the way to State House. How many people in the van? Um, only two of us, Kevasi and I. Yes. And then what I, happened? I think there were some soldiers also, one or two soldiers. And what others. happened when you arrived at State House? When we arrived at State House, the, we could see this. The soldiers had just entered the complex and we were disarming the, the State Guards. Was there any form of resistance at all? No. How did you feel when you saw that the last bastion, that is the state guards, were being disarmed by the coupists? Oh, I felt sad. I felt sad that this was the end of our democracy. This was the end of the enviable result and record that the Gambia has had for decades in terms of um, democratic traditions. And then what happened after that? Well, the same van that took us there, we were put in the same van and taken to Union Barracks. Kebas is here, and myself. We were taken to Union Barracks, we were detained overnight, and um, I was released the following day. But, uh, but while at Union Barracks, were you guarded by the soldiers? Yeah, we were in, a, in an office where you have senior army officers who are there, you know. Were they under custody or no, were no, they no, working? No. These were part of the groupies, you know. Do Ndur you Cham remember, do you recall any one of them? I could re recall Ndur Cham, uh, 
I could call uh, one uh, Lieutenant Cherno Jalo. And, uh, and then, of course, you could see some of them were coming and going the, you know, from time to time. I think I saw. I saw I saw some some student sir also at the at the barracks at one point, and uh, all of them appeared to have been part of the coup, as far as you can recall. Well, well maybe not part of the original instigators, but you know they just they adopted it, it as their own as 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 a fait accompli. Did they embrace it as far as you? Yeah. So while you were there, did you have the chance to see, to hear the, their conversations? Yeah. Did you have the chance to hear their conversations? Um, no, well, was, I think they were talking in general terms about what was going on, the operations, and uh, I was more, you know, involved with discussion, discussions with uh, Keba Sisi as to the, what was going on, but now they... As far as you can recall, did they say anything about the ministers uh, who, who had fled the country? Yeah, yeah. one of them expressed uh, disappointment that the finance minister had left with the former president because they were, you know, they needed his services. Do you recall who said that? No, I can't recall. So you were detained overnight. Uh, during that period, uh, were you put in any cell? No, no, no. We were in, we were in the office. Let's have us coffee. Were you malhandled in any way? No, not at all. So how about Keba Sise, as far as you know? No. He wasn't. So you were released when? Um, the following day, Sunday, in the morning. Okay. And uh, what happened to you after that? Um, no, we first we went to State House. Then the hunter was there with their. Um, afterwards, they came and said, you know, I should go. I could go. Kebas is here, should not be released. So I was driven home and asked to report to the office on Monday, the following Monday. Did you report the following Monday? Yeah, I reported. And what happened? I continued working as a civil servant until uh, October. Until October? What happened in October? In October, there was a, a mass retirement of permanent secretaries, about seven, and I was one of them. Uh, before the coup, on July 21st, 1994, there was to be a naval exercise with the, Niger with the Americans. You recall that? Yeah, the naval exercise was supposed to take place on the 22nd. So did you have any role to play in making arrangements for that exercise? Wow, absolutely no, no role, except to convey the political um, approval for the exercise to take place. Uh, did you have to convey to the Americans uh, the decisions taken as to where the exercise would took, will take place? No. We have looked at material provided by the U.S. ambassador, uh, wherein he suggested uh, that you change the venue of the exercise from Mandinari to the Denton Bridge, thereby making it an urban warfare, an urban warfare game. What do you say to that? That was pure concoction on the part of Andrew Winter. 
It was a lie. Would you, in fact, have authority to change the venue of no, such an exercise? No, I was not involved in the planning of the exercise, and I don't think Andrew Winter was even involved. I'm a civilian. I have absolutely no knowledge or expertise in what would be the optimum location for a military exercise. This thing was being handled by the, by the, army, by the army headquarters and specifically the commander of the marine unit, Major Antuman Saho, alongside, together with the uh, defense attache of the U.S. Embassy, who was also a defense attache for Senegal and based in Dhaka. So I don't think Andrew Winter would I, would, I would not communicate with Andrew Winter on matters relating to the exercise. What do you say to the suggestion by Andrew Winter that you had foreknowledge of the coup and you are in fact complicit in that coup by reason of the fact uh, that you changed the venue of the military exercise, thereby giving the coupist perfect cover in which or under which they can hold the coup without any detection that it was in fact a coup in the making instead of a pure military exercise. What do you say to that? Uh, Council, what I can say is that uh, Andrew Winter has a bottomless appetite for lying and peddling falsehood it was absolutely untrue. You had no foreknowledge that this was going to be a coup? No. We have had testimony about, in fact, three theories of the coup, or of planned coup. One was that Mr. Sehu Sabali, the vice president, or the then vice president, in fact organized or planned the coup. And that is the reason why he was not present at the airport, and that is why he hurriedly got Jawara on the boat, and that is why he never came back. What's your take on that? Did, as permanent secretary, minister of defense, did you have anything any information that would support this theory? I'll call it theory. Do you have anything to support that theory? None whatsoever, Council. Would you say it's a fallacy, as far as you know? I don't think any sensible politician would um, want the military would organize a coup expecting that the soldiers would carry out the coup and hand over power to them. But there are some politicians who may not have that sense. Well, uh, what the, would you say? I don't, I don't think Mr. Sefu Savali was behind the coup. That's my personal. I have no evidence whatsoever. And um, I don't think he would. He was the, he was the, um, the de facto favorite. prime minister. Yeah, he was the favorite of President Jawara within the party and within the government. And he was busy trying to consolidate his political base. See, so I, I, I don't think he would be that, excuse my word, stupid to get the army to organize a coup, thinking that they would organize a coup and make him president. That's never happened in Africa. We have the second theory that Bakari Dabo was disgruntled because he had lost out to Sabali and uh, could also could also be behind the coup. And that is the reason why he hurriedly come back to take up position of Minister of Finance in the expectation that uh, power would be handed over to him soon afterwards. What's your take on that? I mean, I mean, I mean I, Bakari Dabo would never, 
in my view, Bakari Dabo would never, you know, I mean, be part of a, a plot to overthrow a democracy that has been in existence for quite a long time, and especially against a government, you know, which he had served as minister and as vice president. I mean, I think he's too intelligent, he's too smart for that. So it is your suggestion that these two theories, against Sehu Savali and against Bakari Dabo, should just be consigned to that dustbin of conspiracy theories that would never be proven, just like the accusation against yourself. You I agree to that? I think so. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions for the witness. It's uh, time for the break period. Perhaps maybe uh, in view of the fact that Mr. Jack is going back to Addis tomorrow, perhaps he will take the questions from the commissioners uh, before we discharge him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jack, for answering my questions. You're welcome. Uh, thank you very much, um, my counsel, for that, and thank you, Ambassador Jack, uh, for your testimony. Members of the Commission, do you have any questions? Uh, uh, Commissioner Carr, I'll start with you. Commissioner Carr, thank you, Chairman. I have a question. Um, <clears throat> we had testimonies from previous witnesses about soldiers who went to Liberia, and we are not paid their allowances. Do you know the... Do you have any information about that, and what was the possible cause of the delay in, in paying the allowances? Um, payment of allowances to peacekeeping, to troops on peacekeeping operation has been a problem for a long time. And uh, that was what led to the first attempted mutiny. And basically it's because of the this uh, Liberia operations was not funded by the, financed by the UN. So I think it was from um, ECOWAS and the um, Gambia government. Maybe the, resor the resources were not available, you know, to pay them on time. But I think eventually, you know, they got their allowances. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, Commissioner Kinte. The floor. Uh, Asalaamu As Alaikum, Honorable Jack. Um, I don't know how you will perceive uh, uh, President Jawara uh, after Seku has lost his case, where he went to court with uh, uh, the journalists uh, claiming that he has been accused of corruption. He lost the case. I, I'm not sure how others will perceive. But to me, for example, and on the normal circumstances, if you lose a case, it means you have no ground, meaning you cannot prove yourself innocent of it. If you cannot prove yourself innocent of it, you are liable to allegation that, or to be accused that you did it, and so on. Why would, uh, do you think President Jawara would turn around and have Seku as his most favorite? And not only that, trying to relinquish most of his powers to him, especially one, the defense. Since he took office for almost 30 years, he has never given that, that portfolio to anyone except Sheikh Sabali, the, most, the, the one accused of uh, corruption and could not prove anything that will earn them credibility. What's your view? Um, let's look at it this way. Um, it's a presidential prerogative to appoint whosoever you feel should be your principal uh, deputy or assistant. And uh, also maybe he trusted um, uh, Mr. Sabali, you know, more than he did with other political, um, uh, with other politicians. Because I think he was one of those who, who wanted him to you know, to continue with um, as leader of the PPP and not to step down. So he had, maybe he had confidence and, and trust in him that, uh, I think Steve Gustavo was also a loyal politician to President Jawara. He was very loyal to him. So maybe those were the reasons why 
He was made vice president and all the ministries of defense and whatever. Um, you, uh, in that view, it means a, a Seku's loyalty to him uh, was given more regard than his uh, perceived uh, nature as a corrupt somebody. No, like I said, the, it's the prerogative of the president to appoint, you know, ministers, you know, I mean, even top um, vice president, and he exercised that prerogative by appointing him. He put other political considerations, why he was made um, vice president, I think uh, maybe over time it will come out and... Uh, but I cannot answer that question for Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, I'm, uh, Imam Jalo. Commissioner Jalo, the floor. Mr. Jack? Yes, teacher. Do you really sincerely think if Sir Dauda did not join the worship, this coup would have succeeded, in your honest opinion? I. I cannot, I, I cannot uh, speculate, uh, Commissioner. Um, if the Americans had uh, agreed to provide him with security at State House rather than at the board, then, you know, it, it might have been uh, prevented. The show of force by the Americans coming out to State House, not to go to and meet the, meet, meet the troops along Independence Drive, but for them to deploy and, you know, guard the State House, you know, would have um, sent a message to, to, the, to, to the Coupies that it's not going to be easy. And um, also, maybe there was no, there was a panicky situation, you know, in the country on that Monday, uh, Friday morning. You know, the JIC did not meet. You know, the you know, no security committee convened to discuss. Everybody was for themselves, really safety. An alternative would have been to join the, the marine unit vessel and get out of Banjul and go to somewhere else in the country. But uh, benefit of hindsight, that could have been a possibility. And see if you can mobilize support from the um, from some sections of the army or even the population to, you know, to get up and say no. Because th this was a period when coup d'etat had um, lost its uh, uh, allure. This was a time when uh, you carry out a coup, you are suspended from international organizations. You carry out a coup, you, you, you know, you are sanctioned in terms of um, um, Political, um, economic support and financial support from donor countries and from the Bretton Woods institutions. So, yeah, a popular, you know, protest could have could have um, happened if maybe if Sadawda was still around and not joined the vessel because you know that's what he told me that he never asked to be evacuated. So he was prepared to, you know, you know, to face the, you know, the music, so to speak. Thank you, um, Deputy Chair. And yeah. Thank you, Ambassador Jack. My question relates to the trip to Abuja to negotiate for the stay of Colonel Dada. What was the interest of the vice president to go to Nigeria to negotiate for the stay of an officer who had been recalled by his own country? Thank you. 
Well, like I said, um, Dada lobbied the former president to appeal to Abacha for an extension of his assignment. And all that the former vice president did was to go there as an envoy to carry a message, a letter, from the president to Pre uh, um, President Abacha. That was, that, that, was, that, that was his specific role. He didn't go to negotiate. He just went there to hand over a letter from the president, you know, appealing for an extension of Dada's contract. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ambassador. Do you have any concluding remarks to make? Oh, sorry. Uh, Commissioner, my apologies. Mr. Jack. Mr. Jack. Dada Binko Gene. Ngurgi bindo na kuka idjoko. Wonko na yaulegi gene na nilafi. Komningen binde yon kenenki. When Dada was reported, when he was uh, removed as head of the army, was he written to? As you wrote to the next uh, man who came after him? I should think so, yeah. Normally when your contract ends, you know, you are informed that it will not be renewed. So I don't know whether council was able to get the records on that. But uh, normally he should have been written to. Uh, we do not uh, at this stage have a copy of the document, uh, but we have a copy of the document appointing Guadebe. Uh, but of course we have a copy of the letter appointing Dada, uh, which states the duration of his appointment, which was two years. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Ambassador, would you have any concluding remarks to make? We would want to hear from you, and especially your take on uh, the deployment of uh, uh, foreign troops in Gambia or giving command of uh, uh, the Gambian security forces to uh, foreigners. Thank you. Um, the, the presence of foreign troops is not something that is new. I mean, we had, um, during the confederal, during the Senegambia Confederation, we had a confederal army. In fact, the Gambia army is the, was born from the confederation. Had it not been for the confederation, we could have been, um, we, could, we could still have been having the field force or, you know, call it one another. But because there was a confederal army, the Gambia had to, be, you know, um, establish an army so that we can, you know, form a constituent part of the confederal army. So having foreign troops in the country is not um, anything unusual. What is unusual is to have, a, a, you know, a foreigner commanding the, the armed forces. And um, Daunjai was the, during the confederal, confederal Confederation. Daunjai was the army commander. But then we also had Senegalese troops in Gambia. You know. But then with the Nigerians, I think they thought that um, Mabajo was too young to assume responsibility of the army. Yeah, but uh, with the presence of the bat, I think um, they could have tutored him, you know, they could have um, given him the necessary training. I think at one time he was supposed to go, go for training uh, at Staff College somewhere and come and assume control of the army. But, um, the Nigerian Dada saw him as a threat, and um, got involved in all type of machinations, you know, to get him out, to dismiss, have him dismiss. I spoke to the Secretary General, and told him, no, we can't dismiss him. I think the honourable thing would be just to retire him, and then get him some other assignment. And I 
propose the diplomatic service. So I would think that uh, having a foreigner as a as a as a as a, 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 as a commander of a Gambian army was something very unusual, and um, it was born out of suspicion that you know the officers we have there were not matured enough to assume control of the of the army. And uh, I would also want to hope that the um, defense and uh, security committee of the National Assembly will be able to um, provide more uh, more effective oversight of the of the military of the army and uh, but for them to do so they need to be provided with the requisite resources they need expertise on defense matters expertise on security matters to guide them you know on the best way that um, oversight of the army can be exercised by a civilian authority i.e. A, a committee of the National Assembly. I think this would be my concluding remarks, Chair. Uh, thank you. Just one quick question. Um, the decision to give command responsibilities some to Nigerians, did that rise them to the level of the president or to the cabinet, or was it um, below even cabinet level? I think that this was the level of the president. I mean, how it came about, really, I was not in the, in the Ministry of Defense at the time, but um, um, I think the, it must have been through maybe a kitchen cabinet, you know, decision, rather than the level of the, the entire cabinet. Of course, it would be clear at some point with cabinet, but the decision or the idea must have emanated from consultations between the president and his closest advisors and, and closest aides. Thank you. The reason for that last question is it, your answer would help us in uh, trying to find out what office to go get them the documents that we are looking for, but we will continue our our contacts with the government. Mr. But again, thank you very much indeed uh, uh, for agreeing to come and testify before us. We really appreciate your testimony. Council, if we don't have anything to uh, say this afternoon or the, at this session, uh, for circumstances beyond our control, we are not going to have any meeting this afternoon. Tomorrow morning, we would continue with the witness that was supposed to be with us this afternoon. Council, is that the case? Can you just confirm? That is the case, uh, Mr. Chair. I confirm. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. So we will meet tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock uh, sharp. Meeting is adjourned.